Buddhist literature. Early Buddhist literature is generally divided into canonical and non-canonical texts. Canonical texts are the books which lay down the basic tenets and principles of a religion or sect. The various Buddhist schools classify their canonical literature in different ways, some into nine or twelve angas, others into three pitakas. There are Pali, Chinese, and Tibetan versions of the Tipitaka, the three baskets slash collections. The Pali Tipitaka of the Theravada school is the oldest of them all. Pali was a literary language which developed out of a mixture of dialects, particularly those spoken in the Magadha area of eastern India. The Tipitaka consists of three books the Sutta, Vinya, and Abhidhamma. In the Buddhist context, Sutta, from the Sanskrit Sutra, refers to texts that are supposed to contain what the Buddha himself said. The Sutta Pitaka contains the Buddha's discourses on various doctrinal issues in dialogue form. With the exception of a few suttas, the authority of this work was accepted by all Buddhist schools. The Vinya Pitaka has rules for monks and nuns of the Sangha, monastic order. It includes the Padamakha a list of transgressions against monastic discipline and atonements for these. The Abhidhamma Pitaka is a later work, and contains a thorough study and systemization of the teachings of the Sutta Pitaka through lists, summaries, and questions and answers. The three Pitakas are divided into books known as the Nikayas, analogous but not identical to the Agamas of the Buddhist Sanskrit tradition. For instance, the Sutta Pitaka consists of five Nikayas the Dingha, Mahihima, Samayuta, Anguttara, and Kuddhaka Nikayas. The Jataka's stories of the previous births of the Buddha are one of the fifteen books of the Kuddhaka Nikaya, and their composition can be placed between the 3rd century BCE and the 2nd century CE. The Kuddhaka Nikaya also contains the Dhammapada, a collection of verses dealing mainly with ethical sayings, and the Dharagatha and Thurigatha, songs of Buddhist monks and nuns. The Thurigatha, which describes women's experience of renunciation, is especially important because it is one of the very few surviving ancient Indian texts composed by or attributed to women. According to Buddhist tradition, the Sutta and Vinya Pitakas were recited at the first council of monks at Rajagriha immediately after the Buddha's death, and 100 years later at the second council at Vaishali. But their composition must have extended over several centuries, up to the time of the third council convened in the 3rd century BCE during the reign of Ashoka. The composition of the basic core of the Pali Tipitaka can therefore be placed between the 5th and 3rd centuries BCE. The canon is supposed to have been written down in the 1st century BCE in Sri Lanka under the patronage of a king named Vatagamani, by which time it must have undergone further modifications. Non-canonical Buddhist literature in Pali includes the Mylandapanha, 1st century BCE, 1 st century CE which consists of a dialogue on various philosophical issues between King Mylanda no doubt the Indo-Greek Menander and the monk Nagasena. The Nettigandha or Nettipakarana, the Book of Guidance, belongs to the same period and gives a connected account of the teaching of the Buddha. Commentaries on the Tipitaka include a 5th century work by Buddhagasha. The first connected life story of the Buddha O.C. occurs in the Nidanakatha, 1st century. The Pali or Sri Lankan chronicles the Dipavamsa, 4th to 5th centuries, and the Mahavamsa, 5th century, contain a historical come mythical account of the Buddha's life, the Buddhist councils, the Maurya Emperor Ashoka, the kings of Sri Lanka, and the arrival of Buddhism on that island. Apart from texts in Pali, there are several Buddhist works in Sanskrit, and in a mixture of Prakrit and Sanskrit that is often referred to as Buddhist Sanskrit or Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. The trend towards the use of Sanskrit intensified in the Mahayana schools, but some non-Mahayana texts were also composed in Sanskrit or mixed Prakrit Sanskrit. For instance, the canon of the Sarvastivada school is in Sanskrit. The Mahavastu, which has some Mahayana elements, gives a hagiography, sacred biography, of the Buddha and describes the emergence of the monastic order in mixed Sanskrit, Prakrit. The Lalatevistara, 1st to 2nd centuries, a hagiography of the Buddha associated with the Sarvastivada school but strongly tinged with Mahayana elements, is in Sanskrit and mixed Prakrit Sanskrit. P-R-I-M-A-R-Y-S-O-U-R-C-E-S -E Songs of Buddhist Nuns Ubarai's Song Ubarai was a woman of Shravasthi, who attained Nibbana, enlightenment, as an Yupasika, i.e., laywoman. The turning point in her life was an encounter with the Buddha, which took place while she was lamenting the death of her daughter Jiva. The following song is in the form of a dialogue between the Buddha and Ubarai. 
Buddha. Mother, you cry out O Jiva in the woods. Come to yourself, Uberai. Eighty-four thousand daughters, all with the name Jiva, have burned in the funeral fire. For which one do you grieve? Uberai. I had an arrow hidden in my heart and he took it out. That grief for my daughter. The arrow is out. The heart healed of hunger. I take refuge in the Buddha sage, the Dharma, the Sangha. Mitta's song. Mitta was a Sakya woman of Kapalavastu. The first verse of her song speaks of the observances she followed as a lay woman, the second of her life after she became a nun. To be reborn among the gods I fasted and fasted. Every two weeks. Day 8, 14, 15, and a special day. Now with a shaved head and Buddhist robes. I eat one meal a day. I don't long to be a god. There is no fear in my heart. Sanskrit Buddhist texts include Ashvatosha's Buddhakarita, 1 st 2 nd century, and the Avadana texts. The latter contain stories of noteworthy deeds with a moral, they include the Avadana Ashitaka, 2nd century, and the Divyavadana, 4th century, which have stories connected with the Buddha and the Maurya Emperor Ashoka. The 1st century Ashtasahasraka Prajna Paramita and Sadharma Pundarika offer accounts of the various Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, future Buddhas, and Mahayana doctrines. Later works of Mahayana thinkers such as Nagarjuna, Vasubandhu, Asanga, Aryadeva, Buddhapalita, and Dignaga are all in Sanskrit. Buddhist texts are important sources for the history of Buddhism, its doctrines, monastic order, and royal patrons such as Ashoka, revealing many other facets of the polity, society, and economy of their times as well. They offer a non-Brahminical window into ancient India, however, the Brahminical perspective is replaced by a Buddhist one. Jaina Literature The sacred books of the Jainas are collectively known as the Siddhanta or Agama. The language of the earliest texts is an eastern dialect of Prakrit known as Ardha Magadhi. The Jaina monastic order came to be divided into the Shvetambara and Digambara schools, perhaps in about the 3rd century CE. The Shvetambara canon includes the 12 Angas, 12 Avamgas, Upangas, 10 Painas, Prakirnas, 6 Shiasuttas, Chita Sutras, four Mula Suttas, Mula Sutras, and a number of individual texts such as the Nandi Sutta, Nandi Sutra, and Anugodhara, Anuyagadvara. There is some overlap in the content of the canonical literature of the two schools. For instance, the Digambaras accept and give prime importance to the Angas, and some of the texts they club together as the Angabahayas have corresponding Shvetambara texts. According to Shvetambara tradition, the Angas were compiled at a council held at Pataliputra. The compilation of the entire canon is supposed to have taken place in the 5th or 6th century at a council held in Vallabhai in Gujarat, presided over by Devardhai K. Shamashramana. Some of the material in the canon may go back to the 5th or 4th century BCE, but changes and additions continued to be made till the 5th to 6th centuries CE. In order to use such texts as historical sources, a clearer identification of their internal chronology is required. The non-canonical Jaina works are partly in Prakrit dialects, especially Maharashtri, and partly in Sanskrit, which started being used in the early centuries CE. Commentar IES on the canonical works include the Nijudis, Niryuktas, Bashyas, and Chernas in Maharashtri and Prakrit, the early medieval Taikas, Vridis, and Ave Kurnas are in Sanskrit. The genealogical lists in the Jaina Padavalis and the Theravalis contain very precise chronological details about the Jaina saints, but they sometimes contradict each other. The Jaina Puranas, the Shvetambaras call them Karitas, are hagiographies of the Jaina saints known as Tirtha Ankaras, literally Ford Makers, but they contain other material as well. The Adi Purana, 9th century, narrates the life of the first Tirtha Ankara Rishabha, also known as Adinatha. The 8th century Hadivamsa Purana gives a Jaina version of the stories of the Kauravas, Pandavas, Krishna, Bulrama, and others. The Trishishtilakshana Mahapurana by Jinasena and Gunabhadra, 9th century, has life stories of various Jaina saints, kings, and heroes. It also has sections on topics such as life cycle rituals, the interpretation of dreams, town planning, the duties of a warrior, and how a king should rule. The Parishishta Parvan, 12th century, by Hemachandra gives a history of the earliest Jaina teachers and also mentions certain details of political history. A number of Prabandhas, 12th century onwards, 
from Gujarat offer semi-historical accounts of saints and historical characters. Jaina texts also include hymn literature and lyrical poetry. The vast Jaina didactic story, Katha, literature in Sanskrit, Prakrit, and Apabitramsa can offer historia and s clues on the everyday life of their time. The Jaina texts in the Kannada language are discussed further on in this chapter. Jaina literature offers information regarding the history and doctrines of Jainism, the doctrines of rival schools, the life stories of the saints, and the life of monks and nuns in the Sangha. The texts can also be used for information on other aspects of the cultural history of their times. Jaina texts have not, however, been studied or used as extensively by historians as Buddhist sources. Sangam Literature and Later Tamil Works The earliest literature of South India is represented by a group of texts in Old Tamil, often collectively referred to as Sangam Literature. A tradition recorded in post-7th century texts speaks of three Sangams or literary gatherings in ancient times. The first is supposed to have been held in Madurai for 4,440 years, the second at Kapadapuram for 3,700 years, and the third in Madurai for 1,850 years. Although the details of this legend obviously cannot be considered historical, the similarity of language and style within the Sangam corpus suggests the possibility that they were the product of some sort of literary gathering. The case for the historicity of at least the third Sangam is that some of the kings and poets associated with it are historical figures. On the other hand, there is a possibility that the legend of the Sangams may have been based on a very different event the establishment of the Jaina Sangha in Madurai in about the 5th century. In view of the controversy surrounding the tradition of the three Sangams, some scholars prefer to use the term early classical Tamil literature rather than Sangam literature. The Sangam corpus includes six of the eight anthologies of poems included in the Etutokai, the eight collections, and nine of the ten Padas, songs, of the Padapatu, the ten songs. The style and certain historical references in the poems suggest that they were composed between the 3rd century BCE and the 3rd century CE. They were compiled into anthologies in about the mid-8th century. A few centuries later, these anthologies were collected into the super-anthologies, i.e., anthologies of anthologies, called the Etutokai and the Patapatu. The earliest parts of the first two books of the Tolkapiyam can also be included in Sangam literature. The Tolkapiyam is essentially a work on grammar, but it also includes a discussion of phonology, semantics, syntax, and literary conventions. There are two kinds of Sangam poems Akam and Param. Akam poems had love as their theme, while Param poems were mostly about war. A K. Ramanujan, 1999, describes Param poetry as, public poetry, which dealt with all kinds of themes other than love, such as good and evil, community and kingdom. The poems were modeled on the bardic songs of older times and were orally transmitted for an indefinite period before they were written down. The anthologies include a total of 2,381 poems ascribed to 473 poets, 30 of whom were women. The poets came from cities and villages and had varied social and professional backgrounds. They included teachers, merchants, carpenters, astrologers, goldsmiths, blacksmiths, soldiers, ministers, and kings. Due to their varied themes and authorship, Sangam poems offer a good idea of everyday life in the time when they were composed. A number of Tamil didactic works were written in the post-5th century period. The most famous of these is Tiravallavar's Tirakural, a work on ethics, polity, and love, 5th 6th centuries. Of the several Tamil epics, two of the best known are the Silapadakaram and Manameklai. The former is a little earlier than the latter but both were composed in about the 5th to 6th centuries CE. Early medieval Tamil literature includes the inspired and intense devotional poetry of the Vaishnava saints, Alvars, and Shaiva saints, Nayanars or Nayanmars, and their hagiographies. Vaishnava poetry took off with the compositions of Pailvar, Putalvar, and Poikailvar. In the 10th century, Nathamuni collected the Alvar hymns into the canon known as the Nalayaradavya Prabandham. The Alvarvapavam is a sacred biography of the Vaishnava saints. Shaiva devotional literature began with the compositions of Tirumular and Karaikal Amayar. The hymns of the Nayanmar saints were compiled in the 10th century by Nambi and Nambi, and this compilation formed the core of the Shaiva canon, the Tirumure. Nambi also wrote a work called the Tiruttandar Tiruvantadi about the saints. In the 12th century, 
the accounts of the Shiva saints were collected in a text called the Pariyapuranam. All these texts provide valuable insights into the religious and social history of early medieval South India. New genres of Tamil poetry emerged in early medieval times, many in praise of kings and gods. The Kalampakams were poetic compositions in which the last line, word, foot, or syllable of the preceding poem formed the beginning of the succeeding one. Kove were poems in which the verses are arranged in a thematic sequence. Compositions in this genre included, the Pantakove, a 6th-7th century work written in honor of the Pandya king Netumaran, Manakavakakar's Tyrakoveyar, 9th century, in praise of the god Shiva, and Poyamala Pulavar's Tanchivanan Kove, 13th century, about Tanchivanan, a minister and general of a Pandya king. Ula literature comprised songs in praise of gods, sung when the image of the deity was taken out in procession. Tutu poetry consisted of poems in which a message is delivered to a god, lover, or someone else. The moral aphorisms and sayings of Avayar, 9th-10th century, the second of three poet essays by this name, are still popular among Tamil-speaking people today. Of the many Tamil renderings of the Rama legend, the most famous is Kambanzairam Avataram. Tamil versions of the Mahabharata story were also written, of which some fragments survive. Several Tamil lexicons and grammatical works belong to the early medieval period. The Stories of the Two Tamil Epics Although the northern epics were certainly known in early historical South India, the origins of Tamil epic narratives seem to lie in late Sangam compositions such as the Kalitokai and Parapadal rather than in northern influence. The Silapadakaram, the Song of the Anklet, by Island Kovatical, Prince Ascetic, consists of 30 cantos arranged in three books. The outline of the story is as follows, Kovalan, the son of a wealthy merchant, and Kanaki are a young, happily married couple living in Pahar. Kovalan falls in love with a beautiful courtesan named Madhvi and abandons his wife. He eventually returns home after quarreling with Madhvi. Kanaki welcomes him back and offers him her golden anklet to raise some money. They travel to Madurai, capital of the Pandya king, accompanied by a Jaina nun named Kavundi. Kovalan goes off to sell his wife's anklet. He is accused of stealing the queen's anklet, which looks just like Kanaki's, and is executed. Kanaki is devastated. She proves her husband's innocence by bursting open her other anklet it contains. A ruby, whereas the queen's was filled with pearls. The king, who had executed a man unjustly, dies of remorse, his wife. Dies of grief. Kanaki tears off her left breast and hurls it onto the city in fury. Madurai is engulfed in flames. Kanaki joins her husband in heaven, on earth she comes to be worshipped as the ideal wife. Zivalebel points out that the epic's complex treatment of guilt and evil is one of its strengths. So are its multi-layered characters with human flaws and frailties, which evolve as the story progresses. The anklet has an important symbolism Kanaki wears her anklets in the beginning of the story, when she is happy, she removes them after she is abandoned by Kovalan. The anklet is the cause of Kovalan's tragic end and the symbol of truth which ultimately proves his innocence. When Kanaki is united with her husband in heaven, she again wears both her anklets. Although the epic no doubt catered to an elite, educated audience, it tells us a great deal about the lives of ordinary people of the time. The Monomeklai the jewel belt, of Satinar consists of thirty cantos and a preamble. The outline of the story is as follows, Prince Udayakumara is in love with Manameklai, who is not interested in him because she wants to renounce the world and become a Buddhist nun. In order to escape the attentions of the prince, Manameklai assumes the form of a woman named Kayushandikai. She distributes food to the needy people of Madurai, using a magic alms bowl. The husband of the real Kayushandikai sees Monomeklai with the prince and kills him in a fit of jealousy. Monomeklai is put in prison, where she survives many ordeals to which she is subjected. Realizing that she is a saintly person, the queen begs forgiveness and sets her free. Manomeklai eventually reaches Kongchi, where a famine is raging and feeds the poor with her magic alms bowl. She ultimately fulfills her heart's desire by joining the Buddhist Sangha. The Monomeklai is often considered somewhat inferior to the Silapadakaram in terms of its formal literary features. While the Silapadakaram has a Jaina flavor, the Monomeklai has a strong, strident Buddhist tone. Its characters are either good or bad, 
with few shades of grey, and the narrative is marked by many more miracles and supernatural interventions. Early Kannada and Telugu Literature The earliest Kannada inscriptions date from the 5th-6th century onwards, but the oldest surviving piece of literature in this language is the Kavaraja Marga, The Royal Road of the Poets, a 9th century work on poetics. A well-developed tradition of prose and poetry must have existed for some time, as this work mentions many earlier writers and their works which have not survived. Karnataka was a stronghold of Jainism and a significant part of early medieval Kannada literature had Jaina themes. The best known poets of the 10th century were Pampa, Panna, and Rana, all of whom wrote Jaina Puranas. Pampa, author of the Adi Purana, an account of the life of the first Tirtha Ankara Rishabha or Adinatha, also wrote the Vikramarjuna Vijaya, based on the Mahabharata story. Panna wrote both in Sanskrit and in Kannada, and was given the title of Abhayakavi Chakravarti, imperial poet in both languages. Chavundaraya, a general and minister under the Gunga kings, wrote the Trishish Tilakshana Mahapurana, an account of the 24 Jaina saints, in continuous prose. In the 12th century, Nagachandra or Ubhinva Pampa wrote the Ramachandra Charitra Purana, one of many Jaina versions of the Rama story. The interesting Kannada works of the 12th century include Nemanatha's Lilavati, in mixed verse and prose, which tells the love story of a Kadamba prince and a beautiful princess. Place names and inscriptions from the 2nd century CE suggest the antiquity of Telugu, while epigraphs of the 5th to 6th centuries CE reflect the shaping of the classical form of the language. Early medieval inscriptions used verse and are marked by a literary flavor and style. Although there may have been older works, the earliest surviving work of Telugu literature is Nanaya's 11th century rendering of the first two Nanaya half books of the Mahabharata in mixed verse and prose. This work was written at the request of the Eastern Kalyukya king Rajaraja Narandra. Nanaya laid the foundations of Telugu poetic style, and Telugu tradition gave him the epithet Vaganushes Anundu, maker of speech. His style is marked by the use of a variety of Sanskrit and regional meters, and a combination of lengthy Sanskrit compounds with Telugu words. Tikana, a minister associated with the court of Manumasidhai, a ruler based in the Nellari area, added 15 parvas to Nanaya's Mahabharata and set new trends in narrative style. He also composed a work called the Uttararamaya Namu. Another writer who seems to have lived in about this period was Nankoda author of the Kumarasamba Vamu who describes himself as a ruler of a small principality called Oreuru. Telugu literature reached a level of maturity in the 14th century during the Kakataya period and its highest point of achievement during the reign of the Vijayanagara king Krishna Devraya, 1509-29 CE. Other ancient texts, biographies, and histories. Early Indian literature includes a number of masterpieces of poetry and drama which can be read and appreciated for their sheer beauty and fine literary qualities. Such texts are used by historians as sources of information about the times in which they were composed. The earliest Sanskrit poets and playwrights include Ashvaosha and Beza. Ashvaosha was the author of the Buddhakarita, which he describes as a Mahakavya, Saraputra Prakarana, and Sondarananda. Beza wrote several dramas including the Punkaritra, Dudavakya, Balakarita, and Svapnavasavadita. One of the most celebrated names among Sanskrit writers of the first millennium is that of Kalidasa, 4th to 5th centuries, author of the dramas Abhijananashakuntala, Malavakagnamitra, Vikramurvashiya, and poetic works such as the Raghavamsha, Kumarasamhava, and Meghaduta. Their Royal Patrons This has to be kept in mind when using their works as sources of history. This chapter opened with mention of the Rajadarangini, the 12th century historical chronicle of Kashmir by Kalhana. Kalhana refers to earlier historians and chronicles. Apart from the Nilamata Purana, he mentions 11 works of earlier scholars, none of which have survived. Banabhada and his royal biography. Banabhada's Harshakarita is the oldest surviving biography in India. Apart from painting a glowing picture of his patron Harsha of the Pushyabhuti dynasty, the writer also speaks about himself. The early part of Bana's pedigree is mythical and narrates the origins of the Vatsyayana branch of the Bhargava Brahmanas, to which he belonged. The later part is historical. Bana was born in Pritikuta, a Brahmana village in the Kanyakubja area, famed for the learning and stature of its residents. His mother Rajadevi died when he was a small child, and he was brought up by his father who died when he was 14. 
Bono was taught by an illustrious teacher named Barku. In his youth, he set out on a series of travels, accompanied by his half-brothers and a colorful entourage including poets, philosophers, artists, AC tours, monks, ascetics, a gambler, singer, snake doctor, goldsmith, and dancing girl. It is no wonder that he acquired a bit of a reputation. The story goes that one day Bonner received a letter summoning him to present himself in Harsh's court. The audience started off badly. The king had apparently believed the gossip about Bonner's wayward ways and treated him with scant regard. Bonner was quick to defend himself, arguing that although he may have been a bit wild in his youth, he came from a respectable Brahmana family and was currently living a blameless Mar ride life. Within a few days, he became a court favorite and many lavish presents and honors were showered on him. Bono went on to write the Harsha Karita, a EU logistic biography of his patron, as well as a prose romance called the Kadambari. Bono describes the Harsha Karita as an akuka, a genre of texts related to the Itihasa tradition. The episodes in the biography are selected and narrated from a literary and aesthetic perspective. Its descriptions are vivid and literary, and sometimes show a touch of humor. The work displays Bona's skills as a master of Sanskrit prose. Typical of the genre of royal biographies are long, elegant passages eulogizing the king. Consider, for example, the following sentence. He, i.e., Harsha, was embraced by the goddess of royal prosperity, who took him in her arms, and, seizing him by all the royal marks on all his limbs, forced him, however reluctant, to mount the throne and this though he had taken a vow of austerity and did not swerve from his vow, hard like grasping the edge of a sword, clinging closely to duty through fear of stumbling in the uneven path of kings, and attended with all her heart by truth who had been abandoned by all other kings, but had obtained his promise of protection, and waited on reverentially by the reflected images of a fair handmaid standing near, which fell on his toenails, as if they were the ten directions of space impersonate. According to some scholars, the Harsha Charita is incomplete because it ends after Harsha's rescue of his sister Rajyashri from the flames of the pyre on which she sought to end her life, and his accession to the thrones of Thanesar and Kanaoi. However, V. S. Pathak argues that the work is complete as it has all the five well-defined thematic stages of a beginning, effort, the hope of achieving the end, certainty of success, and a conclusion. Rajyashri was Harsha's sister, but her name also means royal glory and Harsha's rescuing her symbolically represents his successful acquisition of royal glory. Although Bana paints Harsha as an ideal, exemplary ruler, traces of a less perfect picture can be found in the nuances of the narrative. For instance, there are hints of a fratricidal struggle for the throne behind the portrayal of the deep brotherly love between Harsha and Rajyavardhana. The Nature of Ancient Indian Historical Traditions As we have seen, the literary sources for ancient and early medieval India include a large volume and variety of texts. Is there any evidence of an interest in preserving the memory of the past, of a historical tradition, in these texts? Romala Thapar, 2000, has made a useful distinction between embedded and externalized forms of history. Embedded history is where the historical consciousness has to be prized out, as in myth, epic, and genealogy. Externalized history reflects a more evident and self-conscious historical consciousness, reflected for instance in chronicles and biographies. Thapar points out that the embedded forms of historical consciousness tended to be connected with lineage-based societies and the externalized ones to state societies. Apart from lists of teachers, later Vedic texts contain certain types of compositions that reflect a historical consciousness. These include the Dainastides, Gathas, Narashamsis, and Okeanas. The Dainastides are hymns praising the generosity and exploits of kings. The Gathas are songs in praise of kings, sung on the occasion of certain sacrifices. Narashamsis were used in rituals and are preserved in texts such as the Brahmanas and Grihaya Sutras. Okeanas are narrative hymns in dialogue form, referring to mythical and possibly historical events. It is interesting to note that all these types of compositions were directly connected with the performance of sacrifices, yajanas. The king lists in the Puranas and epics represent more substantial evidence of an ancient Indian historical tradition. As mentioned earlier, the epics are known as Itihasa, and are supposed to record things that actually happened, whether they did happen in the way in which they are described is another issue. Bards known as Suttas and Magad has played an important role in maintaining these historical traditions. 
The poets and bards of the ancient Tamil land who eulogized their royal patrons can also be seen as creators and transmitters of a historical tradition. The Buddhist Dipavamsa and Mahavamsa, which offer a mythico-historical account of how Buddhism traveled to Sri Lanka, represent a historical tradition as well. Mention may also be made of sacred biographies in the Buddhist, Jaina, and Hindu traditions. Notwithstanding their eulogistic nature, royal biographies too reflect a historical tradition. Mention can also be made of royal inscriptions, many of which have a prashasti, panegyric, containing the king's genealogy and references to his exploits, usually with a view to shower praise on him. The Arthashastra and the Chinese pilgrim Xianzang mention royal archives preserving official records in every Indian city, while Albiruni's 11th century Takakai Hind refers to the archives of the Shahi kings of Kabul. Unfortunately, no such ancient archives survive. While there is evidence of different kinds of historical traditions in ancient and early medieval India, these traditions were very different from our modern notions of history. The intellectuals of every age and society select the aspects of the past they consider important, and interpret and present them in their own way. Since ancient and modern societies differ from each other in so many respects, it is not surprising to find major differences in their ways of looking at the past. Modern historians distinguish between myth and history, ancient texts do not. The historical traditions of ancient India were connected with religious, ritualistic, and court contexts. History in our times is an academic discipline based on research, linked to modern institutions such as universities and research institutes. The ways in which the past was understood and represented in ancient texts are very different from the methods, techniques, and goals of historical research today. The Accounts of Foreign Writers As mentioned earlier, the subcontinent was never an isolated geographical area. Since early times, traders, travelers, pilgrims, settlers, soldiers, goods, and ideas moved to and fro across its frontiers, covering vast distances over land and water. It is therefore not surprising that there are many references to India in foreign texts. Such texts reveal how people from other lands viewed India and its people, what they noticed and found worthy of description. Historians have to distinguish between statements based on hearsay and those grounded in personal experience, between perceptive observations and cases where the writer got things completely wrong. An example of a very unreliable account is the Indica of Ptizias, 4th century BCE, which is full of bizarre stories about India and Indians, collected by the author while living in Persia as a royal physician. The earliest references to India in Greek texts date from the 5th century BCE and their frequency increases thereafter. One of the most famous works is the Indica of Megasthenes, ambassador of Seleucus Nicator to the court of Chandragupta Maurya. The book is lost but later Greek works preserve paraphrases of some of its sections. The many Greek and Latin texts of the 2nd century BCE to the 2nd century CE referring to India include the works of Arion, Strabo, and Pliny the Elder, and the anonymous Peri plus Maris Erythrii, Peri plus of the Erythrian Sea. These texts are especially important for the history of Indian Ocean trade. Albiruni on the writing of the Hindus. The tongue communicates the thought of the speaker to the hearer. Its action has therefore, as it were, a momentary life only, and it would have been impossible to deliver by oral tradition the AC counts of the events of the past to later generations, more particularly if they are separated from them by long periods of time. This has become possible only by a new discovery of the human mind, by the art of writing, which spreads news over space as the winds spread, and over time as the spirits of the deceased spread. Praise therefore be unto him who has arranged creation and created everything for the best. The Hindus are not in the habit of writing on hides, like the Greeks in ancient times. Socrates, on being asked why he did not compose books, gave this reply, I do not transfer knowledge from the living hearts of men to the dead hides of sheep. Muslims, too, used in the early times of Islam to write on hides, example the treaty between the Prophet and the Jews of Kaibar and his letter to Kisra. The copies of the Quran were written on the hides of gazelles, as are still nowadays the copies of the Torah. The Kurdas, or Karta, is made in Egypt, being cut out of the papyrus stock. It was in China that paper was first manufactured. Chinese prisoners introduced the fabrication of paper into Samarkand and thereupon. It was made in various places, so as to meet the existing want. The Hindus have in the south of their country a slender tree like the date and coconut palms, 
bearing edible fruits and leaves of the length of one yard, and as broad as three fingers one put beside the other. They call these leaves tarry and write on them. They bind a book of these leaves together by a cord on which they are arranged, the cord going through all the leaves by a hole in the middle of each. In central and northern India people use the bark of the twos tree, one kind of which is used as a cover for bows. As for the writing or alphabet of the Hindus, we have already mentioned that it once had been lost and forgotten, that nobody cared for it, and that in consequence people became illiterate, sunken into gross ignorance, and entirely estranged from science. But then Vyasa, the son of Parashara, rediscovered their alphabet of fifty letters by an inspiration of God. A letter is called an Akshara. Some people say that originally the number of their letters was less, and that it increased only by degrees. This is P.O.S. Sibyl, or I should even say necessary. The great number of the letters of the Hindu alphabet is explained, firstly, by the fact that they express every letter by a separate sign if it is followed by vowel or a diphthong or a hamza, visarga, or a small extension of the sound beyond the measure of the vowel, and, secondly, by the fact that they have consonants which are not found together in any other language, though they may be found scattered through different languages sounds of such a nature that our tongues, not being familiar with them, can scarcely pronounce them, and that our ears are frequently not able to distinguish between many a cognate pair of them. The Hindus write from the left to the right like the Greeks. They do not write on the basis of a line, above which the heads of the letters rise whilst their tails go down below, as in Arabic writing. On the contrary, their ground line is above, a straight line above every single character, and from this line the letter hangs down and is written under it. Any sign above the line is nothing but a grammatical mark to denote the pronunciation of the character above which it stands. After describing these characteristics of Hindu writing, Albiruni goes on to acknowledge the existence of many different scripts in the land of Hind Sid Damatrika, the most widely known and used in Kashmir, Varanasi, and the country around Kanaoi, Nagara and Malva, Ardhanagari in Bataya and some parts of Sindh, Malwari in Sindh, Karnata in Karnatadesha, Andri in Andhradesha, Dirwari in Dravidadsha, Lari in Litadshat, in Gujarat, Guri, i.e., Gaudi, in Purvadesha, i.e., the eastern country, and the Bhakshuki, used in Udunpur in Purvadesha, described as the writing of the Buddha. Many Chinese monks made long and arduous overland journeys to India, crossing mountains, plateaus, and deserts, in order to collect authentic manuscripts of Buddhist texts, meet Indian monks, and visit places of Buddhist learning and pilgrimage. The best known among those who wrote accounts of their Indian travels are Faxian, Fahin, and Xianzang, Haiyantsung. Faxian's travels extended from 399 to 414 CE and were confined to northern India. Xianzang left his home in 629 CE and spent over 10 years traveling the length and breadth of the country. Yujing, another 7th century Chinese traveler, lived for 10 years in the great monastery of Nalanda. The accounts written by these pilgrims throw light on the history of Buddhism and various other aspects of their time. The rapid political expansion of the Arabs, the unity given to them by Islam, the spread of urban centers, and the patronage of the caliphs had important and far-reaching impact on intellectual ideas and technology in Asia and Europe. Al-Mamun, the 9th century Abbasid caliph, established an academy called the Bital Hikmah, House of Wisdom, in Baghdad. Scholars of this academy busied themselves with an ambitious project of translating Greek, Persian, and Sanskrit texts on philosophy and science into Arabic. The flexibility of Arabic lent itself to the creation of a very precise scientific and technical vocabulary. Moreover, since this was a spoken language, the knowledge of ancient texts became theoretically available to anybody in the swiftly expanding Arab-speaking world. Within the span of a few centuries, the learning and accomplishments of different cultures spread far beyond their original geographical frontiers. There was also a dissemination of elements of popular culture. For instance, the Arabic Kalala W.A. Dima collected fables from various places, including India. Arab scholars initially relied heavily on Greek works, but men such as Jehani, Gardizi, and Albiruni developed their own independent critical points of view. Abu Arihan or Albiruni, a native of Khwarezm or Kava, in modern Turkmenistan, was one of the greatest intellectuals of early medieval times. Only 40 of the 180 books he wrote have survived. 
Albiruni traveled to India to satisfy his curiosity about the land and its people, and to study their ancient texts in their original language. His talk Akihine Coverse a large number of topics including Indian scripts, sciences, geography, astronomy, astrology, philosophy, literature, beliefs, customs, religions, festivals, rituals, social organization, and laws. Apart from the historical value of his descriptions of 11th century India, Albiruni helped modern historians identify the initial year of the Gupta era. The Takakaihin states that the Gupta era began 241 years after the beginning of the Shaka era. Since the Shaka era began in 78 CE, this place is the beginning of the Gupta era in 319 to 20 CE. Several Arabic geographical and travel accounts were written in the early medieval period. Some of these, such as the account of the traveler Suleiman, refer to India. This is not surprising considering that both Arabs and Indians were actively involved in Indian Ocean trade. Such works throw light on trade and aspects of Indian political history. Persian was the language of royal courts and high culture in Central and West Asia in early medieval times, and a number of Persian texts refer to India. The anonymous Chachnama describes how a Brahmana named Chach usurped the throne of Sindh in the mid-7th century and narrates the Arab conquest of that region by Muhammad bin Qasim. The Shahnama of Ferdasi, a classic of Persian poetry, and the Gulistan by the famous poet Saadi, refer incidentally to aspects of Indian trade. 